Hello and welcome to the East and Kicks podcast, a regular magazine program about East Asian film led by me, Andrew Heskins, founder and grandmaster of eastandkicks.com, and James Mudge, our leading writer. Hey up. Each episode we'll be taking a look at the latest films, news and festivals, often chatting to filmmakers and stars along the way. Hello and welcome to our latest show. This time we're focusing on Yoshihiro Nishimura, perhaps the crown prince of Japanese gore, and his latest <laughs> film, Tokyo Dragon Chef, as well as doing a bit of a deep dive into some of his previous work. And we're very happy to be joined by life of action author and action coordinator, Mike Fury. Hey guys. Hey Mike. Hello. <laughs> How are you doing? Um, <laughs> oh, we're good. As good as we can be. Crazy times. Uh, cr- yeah, we're doing okay according crazy. to the circumstances. <laughs> Crazy times require crazy movies, but we'll yes. get on to those in a second. Indeed. Um, before we get on, we, we have that part of the show where we get on to our <laughs> important question. What are you drinking this episode, James? Um, I, I'm starting with a can of Surreal Stout, which is for, from Dark Arts, and it's a, oh, yeah. it's a nice That's 6%. Good. And then I've got about three other cans of different things, which are all about 5%. And then I have a, in case I get desperate, I have a bottle of Famous, <laughs> famous Grouse under the table. <laughs> So we'll see what happens. Well, we'll see what happens. If it's that long a show, it's, you will be under the table as well. Uh, oh, it's just lockdown. <laughs> lockdown booze. What can I do, man? Uh, and you're, what are you on, man? And I am on uh, another from our unofficial sponsors, Howling Hops, <laughs> uh, who are still our unofficial sponsors. Unofficial, sponsors. yeah. I mean, come on, guys. Don't be dogs. <laughs> Get with the program. <laughs> so this is uh, Search and Rescue. Uh-huh. It's uh, deeper and it's 8.3%. Oh, that's nice. 8.3, man. We got a long and roll. We got a long and roll. We got a long and roll. So, on to Tokyo Dragon Chef. A quirky Yakuza ramen musical alien comedy. Could we add anything else in there in terms of genres? Uh, <laughs> yeah, there's a whole lot of different stuff going on. Um, Serial killer. Um, <laughs> yeah, the very odd in, influ- influencer who seems to be able to eat as much as she wants, and that's kind of forgiving. Who seems to be an alien as well? That's the it's possibly an alien. Yes, that's yeah. true. <laughs> so yeah, so it's the, the latest film from Yoshihiro Nishimura, and it's out now on UK DVD and on demand from Terracotta Distribution. Hmm. I mean, where to start with this film apart from the fact that it's a, a, a lot of genres? <laughs> it is, yeah. I mean, uh, I guess just to say something quickly about the plot, or, or at least making the, mm. the plot in kind of a sensible way. Um, okay, good luck. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, I can get it. I'll get it in a few sentences. Uh, but it won't necessarily reflect everything that happens. So, so it, it opens with like a Yakuza guy, uh, Tatsu, who's a uh, fellow who's in like uh, Sonosuna's Tokyo tribe. And he's, he gets out of jail after he's been in there for quite a long stretch. Uh, he's met by his old brother in arms, uh, Ryu. Uh, instead of suggesting they get back to like their life of like mischief and crime and doing that kind of yakuza stuff, he's like, "No, nah, man, let, let's open up a ramen restaurant." Because apparently Tatsu has got really good cooking skills, and he impressed everyone in prison. And all those Tatsu's like, ah, ah. they're like, "Okay, fine, we'll do it. We'll open a ramen restaurant." And they do, and it all starts going really well, and everyone's loving it. Lots of people are coming for their recipes. But then a couple of their old, um, couple of their old rivals try to get a piece of the action as well, and they open like uh, the Ozawa brothers ramen as well, like across the street, of course, because you know why, why wouldn't why wouldn't you open it somewhere else? I don't know, but so it, it looks like we're getting the scene set for some like mad yakuza war between them. But then there's a third party, like some guy called Gizumo, who mm. is, seems dead set on bringing them both down and taking all over the gangs and. Seems very angry about ramen and stuff, and he's got like a bunch of eyeballs. It's got a real problem, things. and in the in the way it's translated, there mm. seems to be he has a problem. He has a an issue with Chinese food. Yeah, he does. He definitely curses <laughs> on it. Um, yeah, not really explored. <laughs> mm. so I, I'm not sure. I'm not sure where that really comes from or goes or anything. But you know, you eventually get to you know, the yakuza guys having to decide what to do with him. But then you know, this makes it probably sound more sensible than it is. It yeah. does, it does. And, and, you know, that guy's got a whole sex. And, and they seem to have taken their sartorial uh, influence from the bad guy in 20th Century Boys via yes. the yes. band The Residents. Okay. With their big eyeballs. Oh, uh, I don't know about The Residents, but I remember 20th Century Boys. Yeah. So. <laughs> mm. Yeah, so, I mean, you, you, that's, that's, that's kind of the plot. Um, where to start with this film, really, in terms of... I mean, it's a very wacky... 
kind of very cute comedy, food based comedy. It's, food it's based got real hints of. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's got it's got um, more than a bit of tampopo in there, and in, in terms of yeah, it's true. Yeah. We've got some musical numbers. Uh, I, I, yeah, I've seen Terracotta have kind of been yeah they've been saying it's like tampopo meets Blues Brothers, I guess, mm-hmm. which is not a million miles off. Uh, is no, what, and particularly know? there is one of the scenes where the song I'm trying to remember the lead line, but it is basically ramen la la ramen, um, and that's definitely <laughs> influenced by uh, Fink. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Aretha Franklin. It very, it echoes the even the guys in, in the in the store. It's done in the sh- in the actual restaurant. Mm-hmm. Definitely echoes the, the the dance from Blues Brothers with Aretha Franklin. Lame, yeah. Lame, lame, lame. Let's go. Lame, lame, lame. Lame no koto kangai natsai. Ano to tachi kenka bakari shite. Nani ka i koto a. Except on a much, much smaller scale, which is possibly part of the problem with it. Mm-hmm. The musical parts don't necessarily kind of fit in with the, the rest of the film in some ways. It, it's yeah. kind of come to sort of pop up quite bizarrely. Yeah, I, I, think that's, I think that's fair to say. I mean, the musical bits are kind of funny, but they're not, they, they don't integrate massively into the film. Uh, I think it's kind of, yeah, it, it's, it's still... It's not even that it tries to. I mean, and I think that's one of the mm-hmm. th- the, the key thing about this film was it's. Like, I love his you know his gore films as we're gonna talk about, um, and this does feel like one of the gore films, but you know, the same sort of really surreal, wacky humor, which you know he doesn't really seem to mind too much the fact that it's some of it hits, some of it misses, but without the kind of like you know money shots, you know, getting thrown. Were you were it, you guys you know, also half expecting a really violent scene to kick in or something to go? <sighs> Horribly wrong. At Definitely at the beginning. Yeah. Definitely at the beginning, because I mean, yeah, I mean, James, you mentioned this as well, but mm. um, it's, it's there's the bit when the, the the lead bad guy first turns up, and it, and that's probably about as as violent as gory as the whole thing gets, where he's <laughs> scratching an eyeball into his that's head. Right. But yeah. you know, and anything. Oh, well, is is, the, is this bad guy going to be? You know, is this going to actually kind of tip over, and we're, are we actually going to go into? Some full on gore. And. Yeah. Spoiler alert, the answer is. Nah. No. It's no. very, it's very <laughs> wholesome, the whole film, but. Uh, I mean, I think, you know, before I'd seen it, um, I think we were kind of prepped for the fact that it wasn't going to be one of his full and gore films, but I still thought there would be a bit Some, more, yeah, yeah <laughs> you know, just from a guy's CV, whether it's his special effects work or um, his directing work, everything, I mean, most of the, you know, pretty high percentage of the stuff is mm-hmm. splatter or, you know, sort of, sort of wacky perversity, because you know, even when he gets very perverse, he's not nasty, and then, but this is, there's none of that in there, but he kind of doesn't ditch the kind of like weirdness which usually sort of the randomness and the surrealness and yeah. like the sudden close-ups of face pulling and everything <laughs> like that which is <laughs> it's still pretty pretty bizarre in a lot of his films it's kind of got that but then it just it doesn't have those kind of like gore payoffs and stuff mm-hmm. um, and I still you know I still quite enjoy the film and everything but it, it, yeah. it, it does feel like there's something missing mm. from the film not just because he's a a splatter filmmaker but because I think it's it, he doesn't ditch the structure of his kind of splatter everything seems to be leading mm. up to a gag if mm. you know what I mean and it, and, and it doesn't really have those gags because a lot of those gags did come from the from the ridiculous amount of gore that he used to yeah the old blood, the films, blood know, geezers the, the, and whatnot. Yeah. particularly the early ones I think uh, you know perhaps well I mean he still had the gags in the sort of later more CGI influence stuff but it yeah, even when he Is went it, more, co- yeah, and then his later ones, he, he definitely went more comedy. 
um, mm-hmm. in, in those. I mean, they, I mean, you know, even the early days, like Tokyo Gore Police and Meatball Machine were pretty funny. But, you know, some of the later stuff went a lot more ex- explicitly into bizarre comedy and stuff. But they still had, like, the gore payoff. So, or just, like, really, really surreal perversions of the human body payoff, or however you put it. Whereas, whereas this one... It feels like he's going in that direction, but he just like kind of cut off the bits at the end where things kind of things kind of actually happen. I mean, it's which is you know it's kind of a it's kind of a weird one for me because there's a lot of things about this film I really like, um, and I'm just slightly confused by it that it doesn't kind of push it over the line and going one way or the other. I'd like toning down the weirdness to make it more mm. of like a properly sort of you know the sort of sweet natured ramen comedy or anything like that. And equally, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't go full, I mean, it's not a bad way to put it, it doesn't go, like, full third window. It's not, like, really quirky, like a lot of their releases mm. used to be known for. That kind of sweet, random, slightly surreal, quirky comedy, which a lot of their stuff, I mean, certainly their earlier releases were, which was great. It, it doesn't commit to that, and equally, it doesn't commit to going, you know, his own sort of gore direction. So it's not quite one thing or the other. Mm. I thought it was a lot of fun and you know you guys yeah absolutely right I think I I wanted a bit more from the action or the payoff at the end when the guys without giving too many spoilers Mm. bad guys (laughs) being kind of cling film wrapped and thrown (laughs) over a balcony a bit yeah that was interesting spoiler alert but that that was just a bit bizarre because again I mean we're coming off to this payoff gags and I just I was expecting that to actually lead to something it seemed a lot of effort to go to and then you're affecting and we're going to get a visual gag here or something and maybe there Mm. was but I I just it just completely missed it I was like oh Uh, and I think as well like for this film because it was obviously made like really low budget everything Mm. like that but for for his other films I think you can be kind of more forgiving of like a gore film and whether it's kind of like in like a trauma style or something like that then as long as you're throwing the red at the screen even when you're getting some like, let's be honest, like pretty budget CGI thrown in, as you quite often do in these things, and it's a lot more forgivable because you're still just you know you're loving the craziness of it all and everything. Whereas this one, you know, it still looks really low budget, but there, you know, there's some parts of it, the low budget charm doesn't quite fit, you know, the kind of the theme of the film and kind of what he's doing with the film, especially I thought in the musical numbers, mm-hmm. to be honest. Yeah, I was I was going to say I don't know if you guys did you guys feel any kind of a maybe a small current day social commentary in like the way these firstly with the with the uh the, the bad guy that you mentioned maybe isn't too keen on chinese food he seemed mm-hmm. to he seemed to have something against the older guys the old the like the mm-hmm. old men almost and Definitely. then but then the old men having to invite uh social media influencers <laughs> to kind of yeah. boost and launch their mm-hmm. restaurants i don't know if that was a kind of a comment on this kind of current trend or comment culture if i'm looking into that a bit too deeply no, but I, no, I, I mean, think that's I think that's fair to say. I, mean, I was just going to say that. I mean, he does that in a lot of his films. Though he throws yeah, in, yeah, definitely, he throws in random social commentary, and and you're not really sure what side he falls on that. Yes. as well, I, I think yeah. you know sometimes you've never really been sure if it's actually this is what I feel about this, or actually what he's saying is, oh, I read about this in the newspaper, I'll just chuck it in. <laughs> Maybe uh, more the latter than anything else. <laughs> I think, yeah, I mean that's fair. I mean, I mean, I, I, I've, I've been rewatching some of his films because. Took me a while to find it in DVDs, but I've been really, you know, I've been really enjoying some of them. But some of the we- the weird bits, even like Tokyo Gore Police and like uh, Vampire Girl, Frankenstein Girl and stuff, you do get that kind of throwy bits and pieces of social commentary. And yeah, I mean, you're totally right. There's there's always like a weird suspicion that maybe there's some social point to it beneath beneath way beneath the stuff. But um, you just get it in fragments. Um, and I think yeah, I think you get that here as well. And you're right, like with the. So the the social media side seems quite pointed, and it's hard yeah. not it's hard not to think that you've got the old guys and you've got the young gizmo, then you've got the social media influencer, and you've got everything going on. It's, but, it's kind of interesting, and you and you kind of feel with the older films, you might have felt that he was siding more with the younger characters, but this really feels like he's siding with the older characters. And <laughs> yes, yeah, if he steps true. away from the mm. the social media and what that that young lot do, <laughs> the young folks. <laughs> <laughs> but it's still but it's still enough there to make it funny it's not very long or anything mm-hmm. crucially so yeah. it stays the welcome and everything and I think it's it's probably just going to be a question of how people approach it or, or what they're expecting from it uh, whether they are like um, you know a Nishimura fan from his other films whether they're expecting like a full on you know, musical or if they're you know if they're coming out expecting something which is quirky but a bit more you know, sort of traditionally quirky, with a more of a straightforward plot and everything like that, which this definitely doesn't have. So, it'll. I'd be very interested to see what more 
not saying that we're we're not like the the average viewer, but you know what I mean. Like, if other people were watching it uh, who weren't familiar with him or anything, I'd be very interested to see that kind of take because it's kind of hard for for guys like us who have watched a lot of his other stuff to review it or talk about it kind of objectively without. And it's not if he was a director who'd done like one or two gore films and he'd done other stuff, it'd be different. But you know, it's like ninety nine point nine percent. You know, mm. and then we have this. So it's um it's an it's it's a very interesting film to see from that perspective as well, just to see him trying something different whether or not this is something else he's going to keep moving into or if he's going to go back to the stuff he's doing before i don't know I, th- I think it's really interesting as well from my point of view and i'm sure you guys uh, see it as the same it's always a challenge when somebody you like whether it, it could be a band it can be a filmmaker the temptation mm. between continuing down the same trajectory or trying yeah. something completely different and it's kind of like mm. i respect elements of both and as yeah. much as we i'm sure we'd love to see like an old school splatterfest it's also interesting <laughs> to see him try something something different. So, yeah, maybe the next one would dictate whether he's continuing down a certain path or he's going to go back to what he was doing before or he's going to try something completely different yet again. Yeah, and I guess, like, there's going to be so many other questions, uh, even just about how film production itself is moving forwards these days anyway, you know, and the kind of... I mean, he he's one of those filmmakers as well who, who's always had, like, a fantastic way of kind of, like, getting more out of very, very low budgets being incredibly resourceful, creative and everything. And so, you know, for this kind of film as well, like, uh, you know, what else influenced the production design of the film, how they use the budget, so the fairly limited locations, you know, the special effects and everything. I, it would be interesting to, to hear him actually talk about that side of it as well. Like, uh, mm. I mean, not just the subject of it, but why it went kind of in this direction rather than one of his others. Because apart from the lack of gore, it's not massively different to one of his other films. In that respect, no, I no. think you know. No, it's just that that that, that one key, that one very big key thing missing called <laughs> called blood. <laughs> and and yeah, I mean, let's talk about that because mm-hmm. you know he is. We all know him, you know, uh, you know, as as yeah, I mean, I called him the crown prince of gore. I mean, there, there are <laughs> the other crown prince of gore, sure and I didn't say the king of gore it. because you know there might be there might be you know other contenders for that in terms of Japanese uh, film, but yeah. You know, I mean, let's let's go into some of his history. You know, in in terms of you know where he started and for sure, yeah, yeah his, for his, sure. Uh, I mean, he, I mean, he was. I mean, a lot of people do call him like the the Tom Savini of Japan and everything like that. Which is, and I think, and you know, let's say let's say um, Tom Savini more than Rick Baker. Yeah, <laughs> and, and and bear in mind that there may be some listeners who don't know who either of those people are. <laughs> oh, what? Well, okay, fair enough. But... Well, you never know. We never know. Oh. But did, did you guys know as well? I thought it was really interesting that he grew up on um, Ray Harryhausen and the Dynamation films as well. Which oh, is, no, um, that's cool. Which is again that kind of stop motion. If you remember the Minotaur and these kind of crazy mm, characters, mm, the, yeah, the skeletons yeah. fighting on the staircase. Um, you can definitely see elements of that, obviously amplified massively in terms of the blood <laughs> and the gore. Yeah, yeah. But um, yeah, it's really interesting. And Tom, Tom Savini as well. So it's um, these physical effect influences, I think, are very apparent. If if you guys agree, definitely. Agree. I think. Yeah, 100%. yeah. I mean, I and I think that's the, that's the sort of stuff that that really um, really came across in, in the sort of the, the when you, you started to to see his work. Yeah. Um, you know the very physical, you know, all kind of you know, tangible effects that he was doing back in the in the day mm-hmm. in, in those early times, and there is something really quite weirdly grotesquely beautiful about you know that that amount of splatter and gore and the prosthetics and all those kind of bits that sort of come together. And there's yeah, and I think that's one of the the big differences from his early stuff is when we started seeing because we had some other you know we'd had stuff like going back to like two thousand. And everything. That's when we'd had stuff like verses, and everything yeah. like coming out audition, and everything, which were still very bloody. But his when he's really started coming into stuff like Meatball Machine and stuff, that's where you started to see not just the gore, but like the the proper like big mad monster makeups and everything like that. You know, sort of big rubbery creature creations and everything like that, which were. I mean, Meatball you know? Machine is quite interesting because it does. It is definitely a child of Tetsuro. Isn't yeah, it? yeah, it's yeah, got it's, it's, born of. This one and it, absolutely, and it's one of the first ones which had kind of really thrown into trying to kind of like you know put that in a sort of uh, you know live action film and everything because Meatball Machine you know it, it it does feel like you know without being like a sort of manga and anime guy myself like it does feel like that I mean you know was you know alien parasites take over humans and make them battle each other I mean it, you know it it is kind of like an anime type plot because it's got you know sweet romance in there 
well, vaguely sweet romance in there and everything as well. Yeah. So it it does feel like that kind of thing. So, and to have that kind of like vision and stuff to actually try and pull that off on such a you know limited budget and everything like that, it's it's pretty incredible the stuff he was achieving. So I mean, let's, let's let's kind of go back to you know um, what films because. I mean, and I do kind of feel like there there were you know quite a few filmmakers and directors who who off and on and quite often worked together at the, uh, yeah, at this sort of you know, as you say sort of from two thousand on really mm. um, you know but let's what were some of the other films that that he worked on at that point uh, I mean round about that time and everything um, well yeah I mean his his early stuff in the early two thousands so I mean that's when he started working with uh, Sona Sion and stuff on, mm. on like you know Suicide Club. Uh, he, I mean, he's worked on a huge number of his films that are moving forward, which is something I, I didn't actually realize until um, a few years ago when I was looking into uh, into Nishimura's career. But he, you know, he, he worked on some other stuff, like what, what, which ones which I remember getting like DVD releases in the states at least, like uh, uh, Rubber's Lover and things. Like that. There's quite a few of these sort of quite weird, sort of slightly per, well, not slightly fairly very perverse sort of right. Jap- <laughs> Japanese ones and everything which he worked on. But even then, there was like quite a, a wide range of stuff, but. It's it's surprising that even from that I mean, so Meatball Machine was like two thousand and five so yeah in that kind of five year period um, he worked on so so many of these films wasn't there a earlier short film yeah he he did I, know, uh, I always get a little bit confused with the Meatball Machine and yeah. it's kind of well no I mean, the... what he did was the Anatomia Anatomia Extinction but that's more what Tokyo Gore Police was a remake of mm. so it's got elements of Meatball Machine but it, it was more linked to Tokyo Gore Police. Uh, in that respect, whereas because me, me, he didn't me, Meatball Machine um, uh, was two thousand and five, and he he did Anatomia back quite a long time before that in like ninety five, mm. so there there was quite a gap between those uh, in those different ones, and because uh, he didn't direct uh, he didn't direct Meatball Machine either, though he he directed like some shorts and stuff around it, which were Meatball Machine shorts. I remember Tokyo Gore Police was one of the most insane things I've ever seen. I think you have to think <laughs> back to, and this is, I think, I mean, it's probably not before the days of YouTube quite, but do you remember that mm-hmm. period where you don't really get the previews and the teasers and as much as you do now spoilers on social media and so on? Yeah. Yeah. It's more or less, you actually get given the disc or, you know, the DVD exactly. or you trade it with your mate and you sit and watch it and you just don't know what's in store. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, I mean, Tokyo Gore Police was the one really where, I, it just blew my mind when I when I saw that film. I mean, that that was what, back in what two thousand and two thousand and eight, yeah. and it was absolutely it was not quite in the times we are now, with things going viral, however the kids say it and everything. But <laughs> it was, but yeah, what watching that film for the first time, some of the stuff in there uh, and everything is still, you know, very nicely burned into my memory. Like you know the 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 woman with like the crocodile for her legs and everything like that, yeah. and that mad the whole mad scene where they're in like the the strip club dance club and. You just get this constant parade of like perverse mutations and everything. It's just, what a, and the whole thing just feels like Starship Troopers, or Robocop, or something at the same time. It's such a, it's a fantastic film. <laughs> ここ数年の間エンジニアと呼ばれる エンジニア肉体に改造を施した凶暴凶悪な殺人犯が増加している。エンジニアの特徴は自分が傷つけられるとその傷口を変形させて狂気化した肉体を形成することだ。奴らは一体どこから生まれてきたのか。その目的は何なのか。は
like had a, a real sort of proper satirical intelligent point and everything which you know we kind of did but when you see yeah, this <laughs> but you see this and it just it does similar stuff and it's such a random throwing everything at the wall kind of way whereas when you watch starship troopers it looks you know it definitely has those points when you watch starship troopers it is kind of quite nicely interwoven into the narrative of everything like that so it's funny but you know if you really wanted to you could probably switch off your brain still and just see it as a normal action film when you watch tokyo gore police the stuff just comes and goes it's just you know, there's not much rhyme or reason to the way it sort of pops yeah. in and out and everything the tokyo police corporation and stuff and some some of the Ro- robocop references in there are just really weird and obscure <laughs> But I think that's, I mean, Tokyo Go Police is the, is, is the point where this, this suddenly just goes massive. Because mm. I think mean, for a lot of us, uh, Meatball Machine didn't get released until after Tokyo Go Police. I think there were a few other mm, things that's that true, kind yeah. of got, you know, you, you'd had verses kind of happen in the, in the early, get released in the early noughties. Yeah. Yeah. Once Tokyo Go Police is out there, suddenly there's a lots and lots of these films coming out. Mm. And they're all, you know, and he he's involved in most of them either directing or doing the special effects yeah. or you know massively involved and they, they do feel like they're, they're quite a, a, a tight group they're appearing in each other's films mm-hmm. you know they're getting you know I've seen from them they're getting other filmmakers in there like uh, Takashi Shimizu yeah I mean, I mean you, know, you know in there as, as a guest star and kind of turning up in one of them but they're, they're really you kind of want. I mean, I, I can't remember if we actually had a name for them rather than just kind of you know the, you you throw around terms like Japanese splatter punk or whatever. They yeah. felt like they kind of almost needed to have some sort of kind of Rat Pack name. You know, they mm. all be doing kind of very kind of similar films and all. I I kind of felt like they had. I'm getting tiny into the kind of the, the battiness of it, but they had a very. South Park kind of sense of humour which I think sometimes didn't necessarily without coming from the same kind of cultural background didn't translate particularly well it was deliberately in bad taste but you mm. know, it kind of sometimes it felt almost worse because you know we're not coming from that same perspective of, of being able to see exactly what they're doing but yeah. definitely kind of had a bit of a bad boy South Park kind of mm. Mm-hmm. They killed Kenny, kind of <laughs> stuff going on. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a, that's a really good point, though. I mean, it's we're looking at these films and we're calling like this wackiness and the randomness and everything like that because some of it doesn't massively make too much sense to us, but we still enjoy. It. I mean, the same like with sort of proper Cantonese and um, Thai comedy, everything mm-hmm. we don't pick up on stuff. So I don't know. Maybe these films seem less bizarre if you you know if you're reading the not you know not reading the subtitles and you're just watching them um more normally i mean it was definitely trying to be politically incorrect yeah quite a few of those films as well mm-hmm. with some of the stuff they were doing but mm-hmm. you know it's we interpret that being a couple of levels away from it you know is, is different from for sure but i mean quite a few of those films it. then they started moving into being funded by or co-funded by like western film uh you know western mm-hmm. companies and everything like that um like even uh, Tokyo Gore Police was funded, co-funded by uh, Tokyo uh, Tokyo Shock, um, yeah. and I, I think some like Machine Girl was as well. I think there was a few of those ones which were part funded by like U.S. resources and everything because they knew they did have like the, especially after because people were you know, although we didn't get it released properly, it still gained like a lot of attention, and they could see yeah. there was kind of quite a good market for this kind of like you know still low budget. But would play you know genre festivals around the world would get released and everything. So, you did the, you, these films were, I think it's fair to say, made partly with the one eye at least on the international market rather than like a just a domestic market because you know they, they're not exactly like V cinema films which were, you know, fine with just being consumed you know online DVD Blu Ray everything in Japan. So it's they they are kind of an interesting cultural mix, uh, in a lot of ways in that respect everything as well I think. Would you say mm. it, it kind of it falls into this kind of sweet spot in that early 2000s period where DVD was so big and it, you know, it came off mm. the back of VHS? Um, and again, this collectability, which I mentioned, I mean, I definitely... Laser disc, sorry, Mike. Yeah. Laser disc. It's got to be laser disc. Uh. La- <laughs> laser disc. Fair, fair play. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. But, um, but no, I, I do, I remember very Not fondly really. as well, um, trading, you know, DVDs with friends or mm-hmm. like, you know, Audition or Itchy the Killer or these where it's like, oh, you have to check yes. this one out and then trading with your friends. And that's, unfortunately, you know, and obviously this doesn't affect us as much, I'm sure, you know, we're all avid collectors still, but a lot of people don't do that anymore. And that era yeah. is kind of... 
have no. gone to a I mean, that, 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 Absolutely. I mean, because it, it's not, you know, if you want to, it's not difficult to hit. It's not difficult to get hold of a lot of films, but actually mm. it still is, really, mm-hmm. um, for a lot of other films. And, you know, not necessarily wanting to kind of pay crazy prices. But it's just, a, it is a different, because what you're talking about there is actually very, equates very well to, you know, going to a record shop, you know, in the 80s or 90s and getting this American import. Yeah. Even more, you know, something that was... Uh, you know, maybe you're taking this, you know, we would have been too young to do it by, by a lot, but, you know, going to America and, and, and getting some some record that only had, yeah, 150 copies pressed mm. up and it's some weird software, you know, it's the same kind of thing, which is a different thing now. It's, mm. it, it is, you know, and, and it, it is, dare I say it, some of the older, some of us older guys who are still kind of into the kind of the media itself, whereas youngsters, they it just consume it online yeah. it's, uh, it's it's not about a, a hard copy of anything really no no, no but it's, it is it is interesting but it has it it, it is kind of, it, it does fuel the different interests as well you mm. know and and you know, as i've been saying there was so much interest in these sort of films and yeah you had uh, all the different you know robo geisha and mm. vampire girl versus frank frankenstein girl all these different films that were coming out at, at this point and and they were really finding an audience you know it's quite but no i mean I have, I have really fond fond memories especially of like going back to um terracotta themselves with like their festival back you know however many years ago that was watching stuff some of these films at, at that kind of festival and everything you know yeah <laughs> <laughs> got you know sad, sadly missed in festival form mm. and everything but that, they, we, yeah absolutely and people got really excited about seeing these films and seeing them on the big screen and there was a period then where so many of these some of the lesser ones well not lesser ones but lesser known ones which you know to be fair Nishimura still did a lot of effects were like Samurai Princess and what not loads of these other ones which were all like one hour ten minutes long or something so they there was a huge wave of people pushing them out on dvd back in those days and it, and it's never most of these ones have never kind of made it on to like the online thing kind of mm-hmm. afterwards and everything like that they've not turned up on the amazon the netflix or the shutter or any of these kind of platforms or anything like that so it does seem like you know, kind of post 2010 everything like that it, it was a very sort of brief and wonderful period and everything then it kind of dropped off mm. yeah we have, yeah. it's always i think it's important to remember that for these kind of low budget often down and dirty type mm. of films even though they're low budget and they're smaller films you know there's obviously um it's a kind of a smaller ceiling to reach in terms of making a profit so i guess yeah. during the, the mm. dvd market and that boom you know, there was actually some money to be made, and and for at least for a collector's market, um, yeah. that was there. But I guess maybe that reflects some of these guys today not making as many of these films, not getting the financing, yeah. or mm-hmm. um, or just simply they're not being the market there to see it that widely beyond like streaming and a, you know and a smaller DVD market. It's 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 quite sad. I think it's easy to look back with nostalgia, but it is, it is. Uh, it's a shame. I, yeah, no, no, I totally agree. And it is surprising that someone you know someone like Shudder who's you know who's like going out and working with um, you know great directors like Joko Anwar and others like that there isn't doesn't seem to be a hunger for these kind of these kind of films to go the same way like because it wouldn't be massively expensive to finance um, but yeah it is quite, it is quite sad I think that might be partly because there is definitely a trend for those um, you know the, like the Indonesian horror horror scene which has suddenly mm. just come on yeah, that's and true. Then, and then, and then, and the problem is until it really starts to take off and people start noticing it in Japan again. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, you know, it's you're not right. going to. It's not going to. It's not. In this case, it's not going to come back. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but it, it. You know, it, it could come back if people actually went and found the old films and then start to find a way to. You know. Put, put, oh, why don't we get some more films like this? Just, just, just get some like mad clips of the gore films. Put them on the TikTok. <laughs> And the kids will watch them on the TikTok. <laughs> and then suddenly, just, I don't know, whoever's hip or cool can repost one of them, not me. But I, I don't even have the TikTok. But, you know, something that's absolutely, that, that's the only way to get to it and everything. It's not going to, especially for these films, which were, um, and especially ones like the, the whole Sushi Typhoon sort of company got started and stuff. It, it was, you know, definitely with a large part of it looking at the international market as well which is great i mean even the only one of the directors who's really kept going and like um who was part of it was sono sion obviously and he's kind of you know he's working with the, the amazon the netflix and everything still but and he's still keeping to he's gone back to doing a bit more of this sort of proper serial killer bloody stuff which he did before he 
went through a very long period of just doing very weird stuff a few times a year, which didn't make much sense. But apart from that, quite a few of these other directors have kind of dropped off the map who are making the films, mm. you know, yeah. sort of certainly pre-2010 and everything, which is a real shame. Because I, I think one of the things I loved about all these films and, you know, stuff like Hell Driver, everything as well, you said like, you know, Robo Geisher, like Dead Sushi, you know, Girls Attack Force, Swim Team versus The Living Dead, things like that. There, there was just, you know, there was a, despite the fact they were so bloody and they were still quite nice, you know, there was a mad, like, yeah. enthusiasm and energy to them as well. There was nothing, mm-hmm. despite the gore, they, they, it was almost like Monty Python gore, if you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. It, yeah didn't, definitely. it definitely didn't feel exploitative or kind yeah. of mean-spirited. It's quite mm-hmm. fun. Yeah, which exactly, which is kind of a weird thing to say about something like Tokyo Gore Police where you do have vaginas turning into things and biting people and everything. <laughs> I guess that's exploitative <laughs> in a way. It was, but it was still funny because the yeah, camera yeah. would just suddenly zoom in on the guy's face going, Whoa! <laughs> and then you just... I kind like, of feel, I feel uh, like we said a very similar thing back last year when we had our podcast on the old... Uh, guinea pig. Guinea pig series. <laughs> oh, man, don't... There's something about it that's uh, not really... It's kind of... It is, but it isn't. Kind of... <laughs> we're still probably the only people who you know, go on the podcast and really... say guinea pig's quite nice. I don't think it's very it's nasty. It's quite sweet, really. I don't think there's a problem with guinea. I don't. It's the same thing, though. If you you know, mm. if you saw, if we give somebody like a couple of screenshots of a few parts of Tokyo Gore Police or a couple of very quick clips of it, yeah, taken out of context, you could think, you know, my God, what is this? You know, horrific butchery and abuse of the human form. But then when you see it and there's like wacky music playing and the cameras all over the place and <laughs> people are shouting and hollering, it's it's not nasty. There's no, like you were saying, Mike. There's no meanness really to it. Yeah. Mm. I don't know. I mean, that's our, you know, our perspective on these things. And it would, sure. and it would, it would absolutely be very interesting to see if. You know, I'm not saying it's a good idea, but if we arrange the film festival of screening like five of those classics, <laughs> you know, the old Genesis or something, and seeing if people were appalled yeah. or not, or who yeah. turned, or more importantly, if people were interested, I guess. Yeah, I think I think you'd find. I think it would be as I completely agree. I think it's just there's an interesting. I think I take interest in that kind of sensitivity aspect, but yeah, it can go yeah. both. Mm. It can go both ways. Sometimes you can be yeah. quite surprised that oh, something that you know, for better or for worse, we're quite conditioned to it. It could even be like an 80s Hong Kong film mm-hmm. or, or the kind of films we're talking about. <laughs> oh, that doesn't play so well now. Quite surprised about that. Mm-hmm. Or it could be that, you know, a new audience actually discovers something interesting and quite fresh and yeah. um, innovative that you don't see as much these days. Yeah, because there's a few, there's still like a few uh, um, Japanese directors out there who are still doing things, which kind of a little bit like this and the kind of gore, st- on the gore side, not quite as wacky maybe, but there, there's nothing quite like this happening regularly or anything like that and, and i guess with him doing tokyo dragon chef then maybe maybe that's the you know maybe that's a sign that there isn't much more of this kind of thing coming and it is maybe just for for interest from audiences over there here at different festivals and everything as well i don't know and i think it seems to me like these a lot of these guys we're talking about are the kind of subversive voices like the south mm-hmm. park creators having a go and kind of like making fun at people's expense um and and like i mean i I saw an interview i think it might even be on youtube an interview with um nishimura where he describes um he says the the japanese film industries industry is a disgrace and he's kind of (laughs) (laughs) and um and when i know we know why he hasn't made any films (laughs) and um i when i met i met tak sakaguchi um a few Mm. years ago and interviewed him and he said, uh, through his translator, the film, the Japanese film industry is shit, if I'm allowed to say that. <laughs> so I think yes, a lot so of these guys, it's quite... Feel free to I mean, censor me. There does so. seem to be a lot of frustration yeah. within the, 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 the guys. Yeah. But I, I think it's just, it's interesting because it's, sometimes it's hard, you know, if maybe from the outside, if you were to view this, you think, oh, like, this is a, this is a, a, a new Japanese film, this is a new Japanese mm-hmm. comedy, this is a new uh, horror movie. But these, I don't think the, these guys are not the status quo. They're the kind of the... Yeah. They're like the punk rocker outsiders making mm-hmm. these crazy mm-hmm. movies, which is which is really interesting. But there's no real. And it still there. Seem like a still young, there. Yeah, exactly. They're still there, and it doesn't seem on the face of things to be like a newer generation. Mm-hmm. You would say replacing them because I mean, like Nishimura, is, he's not. You know, he's like mid fifties now, something like fifty four or fifty five mm-hmm. something. So it, it, but there doesn't seem to be like a mad new generation coming through picking up the baton or at least not stuff we're getting to see everything mm-hmm. like that I, I'm not, and I guess this is one of those things like you know um, you know in China internet filmmaking is becoming such a big thing now and those are not necessarily films which we're really going to get to see over here so uh, I you know I can't say for sure if there aren't 
maybe some filmmakers who were just making in the old days straight to dvd something we got a chance maybe of getting stuff but straight to the internet in japan there's no way someone's going to subtitle that or get hold of it for us so you know and maybe it's traditionally the the kind of the hardline genre stuff is the most easy to translate not just obviously literally in terms of subtitles mm-hmm. but visually and just kind of yes. getting it in a yeah. nutshell no, no absolutely and i think that's one of the reasons those gore films kind of traveled and stuff i mean at that kind of early 2000s period and stuff you know kind of i guess in the west like post we're still even then in like post scream kind of era or where everything was still a bit kind of uh ironic and I'm not, I'm not doing air quotes when I say that. Everything was just... You know, we were still in that everything has to be a bit meta or whatnot for quite a while. Yeah. Uh, and so when this... You know, even though I like quite a lot of those, like Kevin Williams and horror films and stuff, like mm. the horror scene in the in the West was pretty stale, like a lot of the time. Or it's at least the mainstream one. So seeing these films coming from Japan and people were just watching the trailer, as you say, like, like not easy to get hold of in those days and made it even more mysterious, like, and everything. How are you going to see these films and stuff? Yeah. And, they, a lot of them were quite jaw-droppingly just like what, you know, what the fuck is this like, compared to what you were getting in the West at the time which definitely fueled the interest and it doesn't you know without anything like that coming from other directors and stuff it's sad it has kind of cooled off that kind of stuff it's mm. dramatically you know I'd say mm. one of the last ones being probably his um, Meatball Machine mm-hmm. one which she actually directed in what, 2017 and everything which was in Code to Juco? Yeah, I'm not going to try and pronounce it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's a it's a it's an excellent film. It's actually it's one of the. I don't think he's directed any bad films actually, but I think that's one of his best ones. The 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 Meat Bomb Machine 2017 one. It, it's absolutely amazing because he's he's really up the level of complete visual insanity in the film. It's incredibly gory, but you almost forget the gore when you're watching it because it's just some of the stuff and it's so bizarre. And over the top, like, you know, people turned into, like, a human tank and everything like that. You know, <laughs> just race, racing around the streets and everything. And it, it's just... And then suddenly you just have a side plot by some guys who might be cops that like, go into a strip bar. And then, of course, everyone in there turns out to be some kind of mad mutant who attacks them. <laughs> it's just, you know, fantastic, fantastic film. And I don't know how popular or successful it was. I mean, it's... But it, it was a complete... It was like a distillation of that sort of early 2000s mm-hmm. form. Or, you know, think, 2000, 2010 form. Yeah, that's the key. It's the funny key thing of when you start looking at it from the commercial angle. Yeah. You know, you can, they, these films can be incredibly innovative and fun and enjoyable mm-hmm. to watch. But I guess from those guys, and we may or may not always be privy to that information, whether or not sure. uh, you know, they actually did well from it financially or from a career point of view. Mm-hmm. What is good, and I think you know, is, a, is, a, is a, a nice thing to acknowledge as well with these types of movies, especially on the lower budget side, is you can tell these guys have full autonomy to just do whatever yeah. the hell they want. And mm-hmm. sometimes that can come out in its most balmy, insane fashion. <laughs> but that's probably the kind of film that we would like to watch. We don't want to see the watered down, diluted yes. version of a Nishimura film, you know, trying to do something more kind of normal. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. No, 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 I completely agree. And I think that's why, maybe that's why this wave was more was reasonably intense but short lived and stuff because it, it did it did really seem like they were doing this kind of stuff they kind of wanted to do whether it's for fun or you know personal commitment to it I, I don't know but it was all the films in, in that in that kind of at least key five years or something like that I mean all, there's there's not really any of those films of these which are actually really bad or anything like even the ones which are the most and I like trauma films, but it's the most trauma, like, properly lowest common denominator. They're still really easy to watch and fun. Mm-hmm. And they're really short. I mean, even those ones can be, like, an hour to an hour and a half and stuff. So there's nothing there's nothing really to waste your time on. But it's mm-hmm. just... Uh, we're certainly not seeing it transfer to the West now, anything. If anything that's happening in Japan now, we're not... We're sadly not seeing them over here and everything, which is mm. unfortunate, you know? But I guess, again, that could be partly down to the kind of decline in in, in the well, at least a perceived decline um, in the kind of DVD market, the physical media side, apart from the more collector's side of things. But, you know, with, mm. you know, we on the flip side of it, it's kind of hard to feel bleak about it because we do have mm-hmm. more choice than ever with the streaming platforms and everything. So yeah. you think that there must be a kind of a, um, a happy medium where we get access to, to the, you know, even certain PVOD channels that specialize in these kind of unusual yeah. genres. I, I would love to see something like that. Oh, no, for sure. And that's why, I mean, you know, I finally subscribed to the Shutter the other day, and there's like a mad number of like Korean horror films on there and stuff from the last few years. You know, some some ones which I I don't think have been released or screened anywhere else, which is great. So, 
you know, you know, again, like just because I, you know, work in distribution and stuff as well. I mean, it's just thinking about how much it would actually cost to pick up some of these older films now, which are had been released in the, like even you know picking up like you know, Tokyo Gore Police or some of these other ones. It couldn't be that expensive to to get to buy a license that for a year or two to put it on one of these platforms. And everything. I mean, it's just, and I'm not sure if it's just maybe these platforms are just run by damn youngsters who just don't know <laughs> know about this stuff. And but I think that's one of the things about online content though. It is a lot more focused on now what's coming. It's not mm-hmm. so much unless somebody does like a re-release of something. Then mm-hmm. most of the time you have a window of like the last couple of years yeah. when new stuff is coming out. So actually going back and that's when you get into more curating stuff, I guess. So it's probably not even a financial thing. It's more just like if we spend the amount of time and money going back and thinking about these, you know, let, let's get Tokyo Gore, please. Oh, we let's get Hell, Hell, Hell Driver as well. Let's get all these films, put them all on there. That, that's when you become a much more, you know, boutique platform. I guess when you get into like curated content thing, uh, and which is quite a different proposition than a VOD or SVOD type thing. Mm-hmm. But I wish they would because I have trouble finding DVDs, and it yeah. took me it took me about three days to find Tokyo Gore Police, and I was getting really annoyed. Yeah. But I think there's the, there is also the collector's market, which is interesting. That some you know maybe for those of us that are keen to see those films, we would actually rather pick up like a, a new Blu-ray edition then stream it so although it is a niche market we found you know there's so much good stuff being done by the likes of arrow and eureka and these kinds of companies um really you know putting a a a loving package together a great restoration Mm. of these uh of these films which do have cult appeal so it would be Mm. nice to see some of those maybe maybe that is in the works it it seems like they kind of come in trends yeah maybe you know certain Mm. like westerns will be around for a while and then and then there's Mm. horror and there's certain you know certain kind of phases we go through but i'd love to see uh, the kind of titles we're talking about coming back. I mean, they, they actually recently did Versus, didn't they? I think that was Arrow. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's yeah, right. Yeah, very recently. There was a sort of a very comprehensive edition of Versus, mm-hmm. which had the all the different editions of it, all like pretty big catalogue of like interviews mm-hmm. and features and stuff like that. So yeah, no, I, I think and, and a very controversial new colour grading for the yeah, <laughs> yeah I mean, for the uh, release, mm. which which was what the director wanted. So and he wanted to do that in the first place. But, yeah, so. a lot of people <laughs> were not. We're not happy about it at all and everything, but it, it was the director's, you know, it was Kitamura's vision and everything. But I guess if you've seen, I mean, that's the problem with this if you've seen something, you know, it's like 20 years versus everything, and suddenly somebody shows you something which is really different looking, and then you're like, what? No, no, that doesn't look right, you know, it's you can't really think, get around yeah. that. It's interesting letting directors, uh, filmmakers in general, tamper with their work is kind of it's uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, it's we're messy not going terrain. to the old Ridley Scotts and the Wonka yeah. way to go. Oh yeah, let's read it. Yeah. Yeah, no, no. I think if if it's provided <laughs> alongside the original, maybe as a curiosity, yeah. it's fine. But mm. I'm not. I'm just personally not a big fan of when the kind of the the classic, the original that we know and love is put aside and then the so-called director's cut or the new version takes over and that's the only version that's available that's what i'm not totally agree and, totally agree yeah and, and whether the director is involved or not i think there is quite a problem now with there's, there's sort of a trend for color grading but where people want to go with that palette now there's definitely a trend for the sort of the calls and the, it's but, like, you know that actually is, yeah. these colors are meant to be kind of wacky and vibrant they're not meant to look kind of like this was but i think that i mean that's that's something kind of with something blue if, Something like uh, Tokyo Gore Police, for example, would really suffer from, because so much of the film, I assume, deliberately takes place in the dark. So there's very few parts of it which don't, um, which is probably like, you know, it partly doesn't, it doesn't the, necessarily need a, a, an HD 4K restoration. I don't think it would help. Where that, everything's because. brightened up. Exactly, because I mean th- these things are you know, <laughs> it's you know sort of low budget filmmaker making these things like take place in the dark. I mean you get the, the, the yeah. red is like unsurprisingly the main color. For Tokyo Gore Police, even in the lighting, um, like when they're in the strip club bar, everything is red and pink lighting, everything like that. So when you're throwing the gore around, everything, I mean, the blood in that film is is way too thin to be anything like real blood and stuff. But when you're seeing it being thrown around in buckets and stuff, because everything is either black or red lighting, you know, it just it makes it all seem like a lot more so kind of sharp and visceral and stuff. So if you really, if you went color graded that. <laughs> And did it down, and no, oh, I, I, no, I can't really imagine. It, it would be, yeah, no, I can't see that working for these films. So a director's cut as well. I mean, Tokyo Gore Police is fairly long as well. It's like one hour fifty. So mm. I'm not sure what a, a director's cut would actually add to it. I mean, mm-hmm. I get the impression from these films as well with the budgets, like they they shot everything. They- yeah, mm-hmm. I, I don't I don't get the impression they had a lot of interference, and you know, unless yeah. they, you know the versions we saw may have had some 
BBFC cuts, but I don't think uh, so. I, I think these films all pass. I, I don't. I don't think there's anything I ever read about actually. But you know, passed. I mean, the, 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 even if they didn't, that that probably wasn't anything. If they had anything, they'd have exactly. The, exactly, that's what I mean. Like it's not like they had the budget. And Ridley Scott saying, "Okay, we'll, we'll shoot a few extra scenes today. Do you need them? I don't know. We'll see." Yeah. But I think for these guys, it would be like shooting like sixteen-hour days getting everything they can and <laughs> editing it together as much as they can, which is you know part of the energy you feel to these films. And... I've got a question for you guys. If you could yeah, see cool. then, on and the Arrow kind of vibe, or the, well, it's single out to Arrow, but you know, <laughs> these, 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 you know, yeah. any... <laughs> it's the any, arrow. What's yeah. that? It's that yeah. arrow, arrow so, t-shirt you're wearing. Yeah, Arrow t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> my, my briefcase of money passes the screen. Um, Good luck but, to you. you know, yeah. <laughs> any, um, you know, any kind of premium distributor of you know new Blu-rays and so on. Mm. What would be the classic, um, or classic, or even not so classic uh, film of, of this genre that that you'd like to see restored for for both of you guys? I mean, Tokyo. I mean, Tokyo Gore Police. I think. Um, I mean, because the new Meat Bomb was well new. It's like three years ago, but it's still fairly recent and everything. But I think Tokyo Gore Police, out of all of them, still everything. The original Meat Bomb Machine, two thousand and five, when it's still a bit uneven, but Tokyo Gore. Police with its all like Starship Troopers, Robocop vibes. I can say. I mean, I still think that's the, the crown and glory of all of them. And if there was one which I, I would I would you know like see the features about doing the special effects, whatnot, everything. Like, so I wouldn't like to see it re, stored as such, but like definitive edition. I think that, yeah, that, yeah, that yeah. I I would be very interested to see that because I think it's after like a lot of them were made like a lot more uh, quickly and everything, even with yeah. higher budgets. Like, but Tokyo Gore Police is the one which has such a vision to it. I, and I think. I mean, again, you know, I mean, it's interesting. You kind of look at the, you know, it's only a couple of years, but I, I don't think you would necessarily get a great version of, you know, Robo Geisha or the films where they start to use a lot of CGI, <laughs> unless they completely uh, redid the CGI. Yes, you know, that's true. Um, Star Trek, the original series style, um, <laughs> which is not going to make anyone very happy. I think, I mean, for me, I think I'd add, you know, from the same year, The Machine Girl, which actually, yeah, I, I, I really, really enjoy, you know, as, as one of those films that are, I think probably it's a little more kind of held together than, than some of them. It's a little less wacky. It's got a more of a kind of a straight line in terms of its its plot and you know sticking in a, doing a temper on somebody's arm is still going to kind of stick with you isn't it so um, that's good no, that, that, that was a great I mean 2008 that, that was a great year for that mm-hmm. kind of stuff everything so yeah Machine Girl is a good film but then you had quite a few wacky knockoffs of it and everything like the one where the instead of her arm the gun came out of her ass and things like sh- which, shine, which one? Shi- <laughs> uh, shyness machine girl. Okay, that was that one. And everything. So you, you know, you had. But I think this was later when things were getting a bit desperate. Where you had like toilet, <laughs> toilet of the dead, and everything mm. like that, and zombie ass, and which I think was Noboru Iguchi who did Machine Girl as well. But yeah. they were getting pretty. <laughs> <laughs> it's not even saying it's toilet humor because it literally is toilet humor. A toilet humor. <laughs> <laughs> There's nothing else recent in terms of films apart from uh, you know Tokyo Dragon Chef. And without having read any more any interviews with him about it and stuff, I, I'm not sure. Like what he seems to be doing Nishimura now most of the time is like art. He, he's doing mm-hmm. a, spends a lot of time like making uh, you know, which is really interesting stuff actually, really psychedelic stuff, but which is very clearly similar to his designs of his makeup and his creatures and his monsters and mm. stuff so uh, there's some very you, if you see him and the stuff he does on Facebook it's very interesting some of it as well so he seems to be more into that kind of stuff at the moment so he's definitely still we have Tokyo Dragon Chef but he definitely still seems to have like the genre the horror the macabre everything on his brain everything so mm-hmm. uh, we'll, we'll see if he gets back into that side of things hopefully you know Tokyo Dragon Chef is available now from Terracotta Distribution on UK DVD and on demand. Yoshioka Munte Hyakuni Taryuha Sambek no Soudoi Onjitsuga Yamoto no Sashi no Meinich to Naro. So that brings us neatly onto another film starring Nishimura's best buddy and uh, <laughs> often star in his films, Tak Sakaguchi, the film Crazy Samurai Musashi, also known as Crazy Samurai 400 <laughs> t- times one, um, uh, which gives a clue to the body count in this film, <laughs> although I have to say I haven't actually officially counted it, um, which is available now from Wellgo USA on their digital streaming service, Haya and uh, will be released from March the 2nd on US Blu-ray and DVD. Mm. 
there are a lot of samurais in this film. <laughs> Should we try and dive in with what the plot is? Uh, yeah, it's going gonna, it's gonna to take quite a long time. Though. We might need a, a whole episode to cover the, the massive in-depth plot of uh, the film uh, 400 versus 1. Um, yeah, so he's... I mean, it's, you have 10 minutes of... Um, Scene setting, which is basically they're all some clan is like, oh, they're all worried because uh, this other samurai Musashi is on his way to fight them. So, great, so they just send hundreds of guys to stop him and he fights hundreds of guys. That's and it. I guess the, the, the big feature on this is that it's a done, most of that fighting is done as a 77 mm. minute one take, which is the majority of the, the running time for the film. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, that's the, that's the, 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 the big takeaway. That's, that's definitely the um, big, yeah. and, and it's directed by Yuki Shimomura, who has only directed two other films before, but has done a lot of stunt work in mm. the past. Um, those two films were with Sakakushi as well, and they were Death Trance and mm. Reborn. Mm -hmm. And I guess it's worth mentioning some of his other work, which um, includes things like Returner, mm -hmm. Alien vs. Ninja, uh, <laughs> the Gantz films. Um, I think he's also listed as being involved in Flashpoint, the Hong Kong film Flashpoint. Really? That's interesting. Cool. Um, you know, so, uh, yeah, it's, it's for me, I mean, to me, it, it's this film, you know, that the, there is that side of setup, which doesn't really tell you much and is, <laughs> is, it kind of almost kind of promises something else in terms of a, uh, a film. And then we get into just this big, long one take of tack going up against Mm. all these other samurais i think it's it's interesting yeah. when you think back to with uh, particularly with tak sakaguchi um his background his kind of pedigree and background to the action mm. i think he's definitely someone who um who's tried to push the envelope to some mm. extent with throughout a lot of his career so to to culminate in something like this which is obviously it's kind of the don't want to say gimmick but it's the kind of the the um, you know the, the point on which they're hanging their hat for the film about this 77 minute epic mm. um, single take sequence you know just thinking back to even with verses that was I think dubbed as particularly in the west as one of the first full contact Japanese mm. fight films um, maybe interesting as well with Tak with his um, this kind of urban myth street fighting background which we don't know too much about <laughs> but you know he was he's discovered um, uh, you know, supposedly having real street fights and stuff, you know, in, 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 in his youth at least. Um, and then, close. and then, you know, um, applied a lot of that full contact fighting. You don't mm. want to be the stunt guys getting smashed by <laughs> tack in verses. Um, in Yakuza Weapon, you know, let's not forget there was a, a single take sequence in that, which is obviously much shorter. I think it was like mm. seven, eight minutes, something like that. Yeah. But then they, they talked about him um, breaking his neck um, mm. during the sequence and then carried on during the single take. Um, then in Reborn, which you just mentioned with um, Shimomura, um, there was a lot of uh, long take sequences there. And I think there's, there's a, in one particular sequence near the end, he fights around 200 guys with a, um, okay. with a style of choreography that they actually um, developed for the film. I mean, obviously taking influences from elsewhere, but using a lot of mm. close quarters. I think they, they called it zero range combat where he basically lets people get very close to him and then <laughs> you wish you hadn't <laughs> using knives and all sorts of crazy stuff. So I suppose it's like you th thinking about this kind of building block towards this film, you know, towards mm. Crazy Samurai and going for this insane long take. Um, I don't know, just, just to kind of dive in, guys, and I don't, don't know what your thoughts are on this. I mean, I'm quite, I guess I, you know, I'm kind of au fait with action and I, you know, I, I've been a fan for a long time. Um, we've probably, you know, from a choreography standpoint, it's probably not the most ambitious or groundbreaking um, it's, stuff we've it's seen. It's kind of interesting, isn't it? Because, yeah. I mean, I think that's one thing I'd say is that, and, and I think part of that comes out of, of, of the very classical samurai mm. film aesthetic. You know, it's it's very different from the Hong Kong mm -hmm. action wuxia, which comes out of, you know, comes out of Peking opera. Yeah. It's much more aerobatic and... Um, you know, you then you had people like Young Mo Ping who who made the the, the big theatrics much more close. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in terms of the, the way it was filmed, and it's it. Yeah, I, I there isn't much to the fighting really. Yeah. You know, there, it does tend to the samurai aesthetic is you have two people facing off. Yeah. And quite often, what works in the when that works at its best is when you've got that tension between the two people. Mm -hmm. you know, the actual fight itself often doesn't take more than a few seconds, mm -hmm. which 
it doesn't in for, for most of the the rivals that um, Cac faces in this film, yeah. his character <laughs> faces in this film, but yeah. you know, the, 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 a lot of it is the, the, the tension and building up to that moment when people face off against each other. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas here, you don't have that. You don't even really have many protagonists that are actually much of a challenge to him. Yeah, him. that's true. And so it's, it's it's kind of a shame because even doing something like this, obviously, there's a lot that goes into choreographing the, the the amount of time the amount of, of protagonists you know whether they, they whether they had really had 400 people or more likely they had people sort of changing tops and coming back in, <laughs> I back, think so you know and, yeah <laughs> I'm pretty um, sure um, but it, you know it, what is a, a great idea and a, and a great spectacle and we do love the idea of, of, of you know the one take it's, it's you know mm-hmm. it's, it's you know the the you know, we've got examples that aren't actually particularly good, like 1917, where it's not <laughs> actually one take by any means. You know, yeah. and, uh, but you, we've got other ones where they are, and what they do is much more ambitious, like Victoria. You know, mm. this, this, I agree with you. It, it doesn't feel like the, the it feels like there the, the should have been a bit more ambition in the fighting, and perhaps even some of the characterization that's going on around this, ca- the, you know, tax. Yeah. The character. I think I found so. I mean, just just to kind of yeah break, break that down a bit. I found I, I guess initially, and also thinking about Western types of films with this, what they talk about the oneers and the one takes. We well, you know also thinking about um, how how much film is a global thing now. So obviously we all see we see mm. see films from the east, we see films from Hollywood, whether it's. Um, uh, you know the, the likes of John Wick or Atomic Blonde and these long take sequences. We're used to. I think we're you know the bar's really been raised in a very intricate type of choreography, whereas in something like this, the choreography is quite simplistic and repetitious. But what I found is I actually enjoyed it more when you kind of sit back, almost lower expectations with the nuts and bolts of it and just get swept up in the spectacle. Mm-hmm. And that this is a, like a, almost like a never ending fight sequence <laughs> and yeah. him just hacking his way through people. It's actually, I kind of enjoyed it more like a few minutes into it when you adjust expectations as mm. to the kind of thing it's going to mm. be. Um, so I do think that's a good thing, a good mm. expectation yeah. to lay out for people who mm. watch this film. That, that, that you know that yeah, quite literally, you, you do need to be swept up with the, the spectacle and, and not really be looking for some kind of uh, massively satisfying conclusion. <laughs> trying not to do any kind of spoilers there, mm. but you know that that's the way you should approach the film definitely. Yeah, and not not again, not wanting to spoil it for people that um, are interested because I think you know if you are interested or if you're a fan of an aficionado of action and martial arts, you should definitely give it a look. But mm. there's a, a kind of a later uh, sequence, I guess, not not to be included in the seventy seven minute one where he's fighting at the waterfall. So there's mm-hmm. like a separate kind of. Um, segment of the fight I guess you could say and you notice mm-hmm. that's significantly better when it's a short sequence that only lasts mm-hmm. a couple of minutes <laughs> where they've actually been able to choreograph it a lot more intricately because it's yes, a much yes. tighter shorter sequence yeah. and that's used a lot in the trailer as well unsurprisingly um, mm. but you know I, I think looking at the spectacle looking at the stamina involved in that I don't know how many takes it took them to to nail it and get the sequence that they were happy with but you think mm. Tack and those guys having to go through the 77 minute sequence without without cuts you know you wouldn't want to be the guy the stunt guy that messed it up 76 minutes <laughs> in and get, get told off and have to start again but um you know just to to like for anyone who hasn't seen it give uh, give a bit of a um a window into the style you know b- between these bouts of action and the bursts of violence you do get i i, I quite enjoyed these nice moments where you know, he takes a break and he, he mm, kind of yeah, he, yeah. he he takes his conveniently stashed water bottles. <laughs> and <laughs> oh, oh yes, I, they were very convenient, yeah. weren't they? Yeah, he's kind oh, of look, planned. He's planned order. his route <laughs> through the town. Um, you know, he could have had a vending machine with a Pepsi and a <laughs> yeah, a chocolate bar. But oh, that old yeah. Jeff, the you know the guy in town, he's always got a stash of water bottles. Yeah. Right? You see, he scoped the place out very well before he turned yeah. up. Yeah, I, I love how knackered he looks in those bits, though. He's just yeah, yeah you can because it's. <laughs> You know, it's real, and he—it's—he's um, genuinely exhausted. <laughs> it's yeah, not just yeah. you know acting it, and I think that's one of the the good things about it. Well, whilst the choreography isn't flashy, it's all yeah, very sure. efficient. You know, yeah, it's quite. I've I've no idea what's realistic or not when it comes to like samurai fighting. Sure, that, but I mean, I I think as feel uh, you the know, physicality yeah. of him getting exhausted, although more Definitely. and more tired. Yeah, I mean, and as Andy was saying as well, with regard to the like the, the samurai, the, the the samurai style, it would typically be think about the Kurosawa films and all mm-hmm. this. You know, it's very short and sharp, and it quick yeah. exchange, and then that like the fastest guy wins. Mm-hmm. It wouldn't be like a drawn out, you know, 
like a like a samo hung buff, 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 back and forth when you're dealing yeah. with swords and weapons obviously it's going to be very short and I think it, it does achieve that but then when i guess when the choreography is quite clearly being repeated the same moves are coming over yeah. and over and over again yeah. um that's when it could it kind of risks falling a bit flat but then if you i, I think the yeah. only exception yeah. you can find is when you've got the where it's about the scale you know mm. and you get that in seven samurai you get that mm. in um uh, 13 assassins you get that in you know the, the, the later lone wolf and cub movies and that's mm. the only time you 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 really see something different going on in in terms of mm. Um, and how the, the, the you know and it's still pretty short and sharp but there's just lots more of them yeah you know so this is somewhere between the two in that sense yeah, yeah. also I th- one one aspect I would have I would have liked uh, which probably wouldn't have been very practical is if you get the kind of piling up of bodies and I yeah. heard I saw a review of somebody else talking about this because you've got these what is yeah probably a, a more limited number of, of stunt guys not you know um, three or four hundred more limited number <laughs> conveniently falling and crawling off camera and then running to the back and starting again and also you know with the camera moving slowly through the town as, as yeah. attacks fighting everyone you probably can't have bodies all over the place people tripping over and stuff True. so you get people True. falling out of frame whereas if he was literally building up mountains of bodies around him that would be quite <laughs> quite enjoyable but obviously it's, I mean it's not point. it's not that and that's fine but um also ju- just the production i don't know if you guys noticed this at the start of the film it looks quite cinematic and quite yeah. you know, beautifully yeah. shot once they go into this long take sequence it's just not necessarily even a good or bad thing it's just a, an observation they go it seems to go from more like a handheld yeah. you know yes, video yeah. camera style which obviously i understand for the convenience and the the agility of moving in and in and out amongst yeah. the fight it does though look a bit cheaper so that's just something to be aware of that maybe lets them down slightly it's quite a sudden yeah it is quite a sudden jump to it and everything like that yeah. uh, especially like you say since we've seen you know some other parts which were more highlighted in the trailer mm. and everything maybe i mean i i i love the way it was shot though with that kind of mm. roving camera around yeah, yeah. Um, and they do a good job of probably yeah disguising the practical aspects of it mm. and everything mm. so i i was surprisingly quite you know engaged by the film obviously yeah. just just you know because i wouldn't think for myself like it's you know i like tack and i like his crazier films and stuff but 77 minutes and like you say re- pre- basically the same few moves being used mm. over and over it's like watching somebody who like dynasty warriors or one of those video games where you're just going yeah. coming through <laughs> hordes and hordes of people but it's you know, it's still even though there's no plot, just the, the, it's the vague tension of seeing him getting tireder and tireder and mm. turn. He, he's just beating <laughs> twenty guys. <gasps> walks around the corner. There's another twenty. Oh man. Yeah. You know that that's quite fun and stuff. And yeah, you can just you can really just feel the physicality of, of the whole thing. I mean, he, I read that when you know they, they shot it what nine years ago, or something. And then when he you know when he was a lot younger and he he was you know after he finished it, he said he was going to retire. Because yeah. he, you know, he broken a couple of fingers doing it. He broken ribs while doing the film and everything. So, it's it, it's a very very impressive achievement. Yeah. Um, as well, but I, I did enjoy it uh, as well. Yeah. But uh, I I think more than anything, I was just really impressed by the way it was all pulled together and stuff. Yeah, I think that's it's. If you're gonna, it, it, it's kind of it's. The, the whole is greater than the than the smaller details. If you yeah. actually break down, like we're saying, if you break down the cinematography, you know, there's there's better examples. If you break, if you're looking at the mm. the the action design, the choreography, there are better examples. Even for Tax Tax work as a performer, he's probably you know something like Reborn is probably a more interesting mm-hmm. example. But just as an overall, you know, um, as as an overall spectacle, I think it's a, it's a, it's you know it's very enjoyable and it's a yeah. great it's a great example of yeah the stamina of this kind of very highly physical action mm. filmmaking obviously very little in the way of effects it's just like a bunch of sweaty guys yeah. hacking each other <laughs> apart with swords <laughs> I, I thought that was cool about it as well like you know you get some cgi blood and stuff but there's not yeah there's not actually yeah. much which i thought was a big benefit if we yeah. had a lot of the you know we've been talking about nishimura and stuff and like you know the, the use of all the the CGI blood spraying ever, which is great, but it, it's this film doesn't actually feel for an, for a film with that crazy samurai in the title. It doesn't. It's not wacky in the, or anything like that at all. Mm. It's um, you can't call it serious because it is just a fight. But it's mm. you know it feels slightly more grounded if that's the right way to put it. I think. Yeah. I think I think it's an interesting for anyone that's interested in again like shooting action. It's some you know this is maybe mm. quite an inspiring example of something that could be done relatively cheaply. Yeah, it's obviously it's yeah. a huge a huge amount of work and effort that has to go into doing this, and as I say, probably over and over again a number of times to try and to 
to get it right work yeah. out some vague structure and probably some degree of looseness in the fighting you know mm. kind of at the midpoint but it's something that you know that can be done it's something interesting and innovative so for that reason i think it's, a, it's definitely something that i'd recommend people see yeah yeah absolutely i think it's definitely worth yeah. checking out for anyone definitely crazy samurai 400 versus one is released by world go usa uh, available right now on their digital streaming service Haya. Um, and available from the March the 2nd on US Blu-ray and DVD. for now but i'd like to thank mike for being on the program thank you very much thanks so much guys for having me really enjoyed it oh, it's a pleasure man thank you don't forget you can find all of our previous episodes on apple amazon music spotify google or wherever you get your podcasts subscribe now and you'll never miss an episode <laughs> but for now cheers hey cheers <laughs>